Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Tonight we have a list and actually we're all the way to this year in perfume, the year 2004 ranked episode. So I've been going in order. So there's a lot of these previously in a playlist. If you're interested, if you like lists, if that's your thing, um, there's a bunch of these you can go watch. I just thought it would be a cool way to sort of lump fragrances together, talk about a lot of fragrances at one time. So these are all fragrances from my collection that I either have full bottles of or they've been reviewed on my channel. So if it's only a sample, I've reviewed it on the channel. Um, otherwise, they're put as an honorary mention. So we have a top 16 list today for you guys. So very excited about that. Um, but before I forget, December 10th, noon, Central Standard Time, Sultan Pasha, the great, the maestro of guitars, joining the channel, and I've been wearing his guitars lately uh, to get to know the scents even better. I've been wearing them a lot to bed, but I haven't been wearing them as my scent of the day uh, till recently. Today, I wore Ensar Rose again for the second day in a row. Um, I was all dressed up in a suit yesterday and I actually did not get a chance to do a video, uh, but I will be dressed up again when Sultan Pasha comes on the channel. And so I wore Ensar Rose yesterday with the suit and it worked absolutely beautifully. There is an unbelievable uh, rose note in here. This white ro rose Alba Otto in the, in, in the top with uh, Persian rose Otto, Bulgarian rose Absolute, um, a little bit of honey, just a little bit, and really... For me, the star of the show is a couple things. One, one of the most unbelievable Mysore sandalwood notes I've ever encountered in a perfume. And the second thing is um, this, what they just call Indian Oud on Parfumo. But if you dig deeper, you'll learn it's actually a very rare and um, almost historic Oud uh, distillation by Ensar Oud. Hence the name Ensar Rose. And the, and the name of that distillation is called Oud Yunus. And Oud Yunus is supposed to be this gentle and soft Oud with a Herculean strength, as he calls it, radiating sunshine with sweet dried plums on the surface and unfathomable depth. It's one of the oldest, wildest, and rarest Oud, Hindi Oud uh, collections that Ensar got a chance to distill. And, and Ensar basically says wild Oud is no more. I mean, is basically the way that he, he uh, if you listen to him talk, he says well, finding wild Oud is basically impossible nowadays. Um at least in this part of the world they're looking. Um, and so this sort of gives off this um, fruit-like note, but so it's not super animalic. Most Indian oud is like fermented, you know, barnyard, fertilizer chips, whatever. It's not that at all. This is completely different, and it's so, so beautiful. And you know what's crazy? I gave my daughter a bath, and so, you know, when you're giving a baby a bath, it's just water all over your hands and I like to put it on the top of my hands or right here or you know on so I can kind of smell it and get to know it throughout the day and um the attar on my hand literally smells like sometimes when you you know get your hands wet if you have a perfume on it'll kind of rinse it off a little bit not with the attar with the attar it's like the water just slides off its back like it's a dolphin or something you can still smell it perfectly um so very interesting. I'm not used to wearing guitars, you know, as my scent of the day, but I'm getting used to it. And, I, and you know what's crazy is I'm really starting to enjoy it even more um, than I thought I would. So um, that's a little bit scary, but I'm liking I'm liking uh, Sultan Pasha's work. Very impressed. So two honorary mentions that I have samples of, excuse me, from 2004 um, that I have not reviewed yet. One is a sample from my good friend Rich Mitch, which I cannot find. I, I probably spent entirely too much time looking for this sample for you guys, just to show the stupid little sample. Um, and it's called Full Choke by Francesco Smalto. So once it turns up, I'll review the damn thing one of these days, but it's a um, pure Bourdon fragrance when he was working for Fragrance Resources. And Full Choke um, has a gunpowder note that's very similar to the gunpowder note in Creed Himalaya. If you know Himalaya, there's a brilliant gunpowder note in there. There's a, uh, in the book, uh, the ghost perfumer, uh, Gabe Ot Oppenheim, o Oppenheim, I think his name is, if that's not his name, I apologize, but, uh, the ghost perfumer is the book, and, um, he basically wrote a brilliant passage there where, um, the owner or the head man at Dior in the 90s and, and Pierre Bourdon began to work on this gunpowder note, and then that person who's like a legend, I forget his name, um, maybe Roger something, but he had to, he, he left, he had health problems, he had to leave, the new guy said, nope, we're not going to do that, and so Pierre Bourdon, of course, as usual, got down and just wanted that gunpowder note to have a place in perfumery, and so, uh, hence how Creed got it in Himalaya, and, uh, but it's used again in full choke, and you know what else is used in full choke, sorry, I'm waving this around like, like, uh, 
I don't know what I'm waving it around like, like a ruler. Um, but there is a pineapple note in the top of this. One of the many fragrances that uh, Pierre Bourdon used a pineapple note before uh, his pupil, Jean-Christophe Hérault, used it in Aventus to such acclaim and success. And I do love Aventus, I'm not going to lie, especially the older bottles. Um, someone left me a comment and said the new 2023 batch of Aventus is quite good, but it might be too little too late as far as I'm concerned. Um, so Full Choke is from 2004 which I do have a sample somewhere, thanks to Rich Mitch. The other one, which I was able to find, is thanks to my good friend Anuj at Enchante Perfumes, EnchantePerfumes.com for vintage fragrances. I mean, there's nowhere better to go, in my opinion. And this is called um, Armani Code. And um, Armani Code is a um, designer, obviously. Um, it's interesting because... Uh, maybe it's just the version that I'm looking at, but on Parfumo, the version from 2004 said it was discontinued. It was last marketed by L'Oreal. They're not making it anymore. So I don't know if they just renamed it or, or I have no clue what's going on with Armani perfumes. I have to say outside of the one Armani that's going to make an appearance on this particular video, I own zero others. So Armani code is not my thing. It's too sweet. There is an interesting star anise and olive blossom note in here, and it is a Antoine Lee. But this is while Antoine Lee was still sort of stuck in the machine making these type of perfumes before he broke free and went to uh, Atel Libre d'Orange and made things like Rien and all these amazing perfumes. Uh, and, and currently he sort of became the legend that he is. Um, so this is an, uh, for a designer from almost 20 years ago, which is crazy to think 2004 is 20 years ago. Um, it's okay. I'll, I'll review it one of these days. Armani Code uh, by Giorgio Armani. So I guess we should do a little bit of a uh, get ourselves in the mood of 2004. But first, since I'm wearing a attar that has one of the most amazing um, Mysore sandalwood notes, I figured I would just put a little drop of actual Mysore sandalwood from 1906 on my skin. This is thanks to my good friend Russian Adam. Oh, God. This um, slightly floral, slightly... Um, Uh, it's just so, oh, it's so relaxing. You know, real Mysore sandalwood is um, one of the most beautiful materials in perfumery. The problem is, and I think that is an issue when perfumers like Sultan Pasha use real Mysore sandalwood, is that it's such a soft smell. So, like you can smell the woodiness, but it's almost like you're smelling... The whole scene of the sandalwood that it's grow that it's like you're smelling the whole sandalwood tree. You're not just smelling the wood itself, right? You're not just smelling the heartwood. Like back in the day when they made high quality Mysore distillations, they would only distill the heartwood. They would actually separate the rest of the wood from the heartwood and only distill the heartwood. And then, of course, as everything got cheaper because everything gets worse, I don't care what anyone says, it gets worse. Um, they started bringing in the rest of the wood, which should not be included in the high quality heartwood distillation so they could increase the yield and that lowers the, the quality. When you smell something like this, it's like one of the most smoothest smells you could ever describe. It's so unbelievably smooth and milky and soft and spongy and buttery and just you know, like I said this on a previous video, but like you could just trust fall on your Mysore sandalwood and the sponginess would just catch you like a, like a cloud, like a, like a Tempur-Pedic mattress. I don't know, some, something soft and spongy, right? Or Tempur-Pedic soft, I don't, I don't know. But, um, oh, it's just it's one of the most beautiful, you know, getting to smell stuff like this. I have to say, getting to smell stuff like this and getting to smell stuff like this is one of the biggest advantages, I would say, about having a channel because people like Sultan Pasha and Russian Adam have allowed me to smell some things that otherwise I never, ever would have been able to smell. So uh, just a little bit of a tangent, but thank you to them, and I can't wait to have Sultan Pasha on the channel. So we're going to do something special because I'm in a good mood today. We are going to smell these fragrances, or most of them. Um, you know, I started to do the video, and then I decided, you know what? I want to smell these. 
Um, and I got through a couple of them before and I said, you know what, I'm going to delete that video and I want to smell these with you guys. So we're going to get started. Um, I guess I said we were going to put ourselves in the mood for 2004 first. Here I am. It's 10 minutes in. We haven't even done one actual fragrance from the list. Um, so the songs from 2004. So, uh, for me, 2004 was all about Green Day's American Idiot and the album, uh, I think, which was also called American Idiot. Um, but you know, that album for me, I must have played that uh, a million times on repeat. Of course, there was also things like Drop It Like It's Hot from Snoop Dogg, Lean Back, Fat Joe, My Band from D12, which is a hilarious video, Sunshine from Little Flip, um, what else? Lose My Breath, Destiny's Child, Usher had a couple big hits in 2004, um, you know, I, uh, just lose it, Eminem. Okay, so yes, it's uh, 2004 was my very first year of college. And so you can imagine there was a lot of beer drinking and playing pool for me. I love to just get, go to the pool hall, drink beer, play pool all day, um, and occasionally do a little bit of studying. But um, I think in 2004, Ronald Reagan passed away, if memory serves. I think in 2004, that was the year that George Bush defeated um, John Kerry. Um, and so, and of course there were headlines of the Iraq war, cause that was still obviously in full swing in 2004, full of the war, the battles for Fallujah and stuff like that were in the headlines. But, you know, um, for me, obviously being, uh, a college, college kid at that time, it was mostly just parties and, and good times. I was, that was the prime of the Rams life there. And so, um, ah, yes, REM leaving New York. How, how could I forget? REM is one of my favorite uh, bands of all time, and they they did put out an album in 2004, so I'm glad I saw that real quick. Um, in movies, 2004 in films, we'll just do a top 10. Ocean's 12, um, this is according to, I guess, the best grossing films of 2004. Ocean's 12, Shark Tale, Troy, Meet the Fockers, The Day After Tomorrow, The Passion of the Christ, ah, that brings me back. I remember my girlfriend at the time and her grandmother was all over me to watch The Passion of the Christ. How have you not seen The Passion of the Christ? So damn it, I watched The Passion of the Christ just so she would be happy. The Incredibles, Spider-Man 2, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and Shrek 2 is the number one highest grossing film of 2004 with almost a billion dollars. That is unbelievable. Um, okay, let's get back to perfume. So first of all, let's do these in order. So this is going to be a ranked uh, top 16 list. And I have to say, this was a very hard list because... I don't think there's a bad fragrance in this list necessarily, but these are just according to my personal preference. And so that could change tomorrow. I really struggled with the ones at the top, really, really struggled with the top three or four. They all could have been intertwined. You know, it could be different tomorrow. And don't forget my personal choice. So I'm not saying number one's better than number 16. You love number 16, wear it. If you love a fragrance I say is shite, don't listen to me, wear it. Um, so number 16 is a... Loewe fragrance, and um, let me label the blotter here. I guess I should have had these pre-labeled. Um, so this is probably my least favorite Loewe fragrance, but I'm not giving up on it yet. It's called Solo by the House of Loewe from 2004. Go figure. How many times am I going to say that in this in this video? Um, so, and I just sprayed my camera, just absolutely layered my camera with... Uh, well, the other camera, not this one, with uh, Solo. You know, there's this very strange... So here's the thing about Solo. I never necessarily thought it was a bad fragrance. I just never liked it, uh -huh, if that makes sense. Because there's this very weird, antiseptic, cleaner vibe in the opening. And it blends in with this um, very strange note of guava. And guava in perfume... I must admit, I've never thought, man, I really wish there was a guava note in my perfume. No. But every time I smell this, I think, you know what? If um, if there was like a perfume that made me think about South America, this would be it. Because I know people in South America love guava. I know that's a big thing in South America and maybe even Mexico and stuff like that. Um, And so this really gives me that South American vibe for some reason. And it's made by some, actually, some pretty high, um, 
pretty highfalutin perfumers. There's Carlos Benaim, who I am a huge fan of, Laurent Leguernac, and Emilio Valeros. Okay, so the last two I don't know, but Carlos Benaim is star power to me. And this is actually still available, so that means it's still selling well enough that LVMH has decided, because LVMH owns Loewe. They've decided that, obviously, so maybe this is a big seller in South America. I don't know. But it, they're, they're, the lavender, I think, just gives it this sort of... Sometimes lavender can come across as, like, cleaner. You know, not cleaner, but, like, detergent, right? And, and here it does that to me. I get a really, like, fresh clothes fresh clothes out of the washer dry um, vibe and there is thyme and nutmeg and patchouli and cumin and cashmere and cashmere which is cashmere and bergamot and there's all these scent you know mandarin orange bergamot and lemon so it's citrusy and fresh and maybe that's like that you know antiseptic cleaner vibe thing in the opening and there's also a little bit of cinnamon so it's supposed to have a little woody you know um, the patchouli makes it slightly woody but um, just never moved me. I don't know. It's like a weird, fresh, sweet, citrusy thing. Uh, and for a designer, I guess it's interesting enough that it's still selling. It's just not my thing. It never has been. And I won't give up on it, but um, one of these days, maybe I'll make myself wear it. I think this would probably, my guess is, work best in the summer, in the, in the heat, because it has that citrus slash fruit. And the fruit is interesting, right? So, I mean... Just imagine if guava became the pineapple of, um, instead of pineapple, we'd be smelling like this all the time. So, Loewe's Solo at number 16. Number 15. Um, number 15 is another sweet fragrance, actually maybe even sweeter than Solo. And this is from the House of Bogart. And this is created by the great... Maurice Roussel, who of course has created some amazing sweet fragrances, Rochas Man, um, Bond Number no. Nine, New Harlem, and um, so this is um, Bogart Pour Homme, as I said. I love Bogart. I love the House of Bogart. Even this, even this, because um, you know sometimes when you're, um, it's December right now, right, and sometimes. One thing I've learned about perfume is I could sit up here and say, this is shite, it sucks ass, it's too, way too sweet, and blah, 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 right? And I could just piss all shit all over it, right? Um, but the reality is there are days where it's cold outside, and I crave this. I crave something like this. And maybe I'll want to reach for Amen, um, you know, Pure Havana or something like that. But maybe I won't. Maybe I want this. You know, this this does what Amen's um, Pure Havana does very well, actually. It, it's a good... They're a little different because if you know the way that Maurice Roussel likes to use that lavender note, um, it takes it in a little different direction than Pure Havana, but it brings in this strange sweet floral bit that even though there's a lot of tonka and vanilla and patchouli and spices in the base there's no tobacco note listed but it gives off this cherry tobacco vibe when you smell it and um i think that is what reminds people of pure havan and you know it because of the the lavender like i said it definitely goes, I like the lavender in this more than I like the lavender in Solo, which is probably shocking to, to some people, since this is like considered to be ultra synthetic. And But I think Maurice Roussel did a great job with this. I think if this wasn't $20, like if this was 100 bucks, people wouldn't talk about it the way that they do. I think the price tag imprints cheapness in their brain. It's not. The House of Bogart is not cheap, I'm telling you. Um, there's only one fragrance I've ever smelled from the House of Bogart that I think smells cheap. And I won't tell you what that is today, but maybe I'll review it one of these days. But I really like this. I really do. And I know I, I hate sweet fragrances, but sometimes their sweet fragrances just work. Sometimes. sometimes very rarely. Um, this is definitely not something you could wear all the time. You would get so sick of it. At least I would. I would get so sick of this. But when it hits right, I mean, there that hits the spot when that's what you need. So, um, Bogart Pour Homme at number 15. Number 14 is a John Varvatos. And you know what? This could be even higher rated, in my opinion. Um, this is 
the original John Barbados from 2004, obviously, it's on this list. Um, and this was created by the great Rodrigo Flores Rue. And um, this is a designer. That is how you do a designer. In my opinion, I think that um, Rodrigo Flores Rue is just, I mean, what he did with the John Barbados line for the money, pure brilliance. And some people compare this to the long lost DK men from 1994. I don't see that personally. And I'll review that one one of these days. It's, it's up above those samples somewhere. Um, but this is tamarind leaf, herbs, dates, clary sage, coriander seeds, ajawan, balsams, black leather, amber, vanilla, and oud. Now, according to the back of the bottle, this is tamarind, tree leaves, excuse me, sage, sage flower, Mediterranean herbs, aura amber, I don't know what aura amber is, vanilla and black leather essence. And I'll tell you something about my good friend Rodrigo Flores Rue. That man um, can do a leather note. He absolutely can do a leather note. I have a theory that he is uh, worked on some perfumes that he is not credited to, that are credited to other people, but he actually did the work on it. I won't tell you who that is, um, but if you've smelled some of his leathers and things like this, or um, Dark Rebel Rider by the same house, it looks like there's a, um, it looks like it's wearing like a motorcycle jacket or something, right? It's got like a leather jacket on. This is an amazing designer leather. And, um, you know, there are some leathers that are from houses that sell for like $500, $800, $1,000. $1, I wouldn't be surprised if he worked on some of those. He does a leather accord. Just, it's beautiful. It really is. Um, now, there is something I should mention with John Barbado fragrances. Um, that is that I got this particular bottle when it was marketed by EA Fragrances. Okay, The marketer now is Revlon Inc. I don't know if the formula has changed. I can't tell you. Um, but John Barbados went out of business or their fragrance line went bankrupt. And then Revlon bought the licenses and is continuing them on, right? Um the other thing about John Barbados fragrances is they are notoriously weak, but when they give you 125 mils of juice for, you know, I think I paid like $18 for this or something. Spray away, people. Spray away. Um, spicy, woody, that date note makes it smell unique for a designer. I mean, amazing. Amazing stuff. Easily could have been higher. And number 14. Number 13. Uh, number 13 is a um, Discovery Atomizer of a Thierry Mugler fragrance. And it's it's funny because if you go to Parfumo and you um, try to find anything that doesn't start with A, good luck to you. Because there's like 10 pages of A for Amen, Angel, you know, all these Angel and Amen flankers. And then finally you get to B-Men, which is what this is. This is Thierry Mugler's B-Men from 2004. Of course, Jacques Houclier, um, who perfumed all of the Amen line and flankers, made this. But he also made it with a interesting nose, Christine Nagel, who's now the in-house perfumer at Hermes. But she was not the in-house perfumer at Hermes whenever this was being produced, of course. Oh, and you know what? Um, this is, obviously it has that DNA of Thierry Mugler. Um, there's just no getting around it. That ethyl maltol patchouli thing, it's here, trust me. Even though there's no patchouli listed, it's here. 100% it's here. This amber, you know, I don't know what you would call it. It's like a, it's like a Mugler rod, right? Um, but this opens up with one of the most interesting rhubarb notes uh, I've smelled in perfumery. And it almost smells like there's an anise note. There isn't one, but it almost smells like one. And it also almost smells like there is a 
little bit of a booziness in here. Again, not listed. The notes are fruits and rhubarb in the top, and there's definitely that tart rhubarb. Like, just imagine rhubarb pie, right? Imagine rhubarb pie sitting on like an amen base with that ambery, patchouli, ethyl maltol sweetness with spices. And what's crazy is there is a note in here that I hardly ever see in perfumery. Um, and that note is called uh, sequoia. And I can't tell you I know what sequoia smells like, to be honest with you. But apparently... Um, the, the experts say it's probably some sort of a fantasy note, but, um, if you know sequoias, they're those huge, giant fucking trees, right? Um, they're, they're a member of the cypress family, but they're redwood, giant redwood member of the cypress family. They grow for thousands, they grow for thousands of years, okay? Um, so I, I don't know what sequoia wood smells like. But some say that it's kind of like a weird blend of oak moss, pine needles, and vetiver. I don't know. All I know is that there is this, uh, if you didn't know what this was, you would go, amen, flanker. Like, 100%, amen, flanker, right off the gate. But I love, I, I just, you know, I have a soft spot for Thierry Mugler. For that whole line, I think it's one of the better designer lines. And this is one that gets overlooked. And again, even by me, look, I only have a little decant thing. I don't even have a bottle. Um, but I'll, I'll review it before my little decant goes away. But I like that at number 13. Number 12. Number 12 is the first niche on the list. And it is a creation by none other than um, Giza Schoen. And this is sort of Giza Schoen doing boring office, easy to wear, it's well done, okay? It's a woody, spicy, but is it boring? Yes, it's absolutely boring. There's no way to get around the fact that it's not boring. Um, but it's but if you wanted to wear something like to a, I don't know, maybe like an interview or something, and you didn't want to offend anyone or you didn't want to, you know, wear something crazy, you want to wear something formal. Let's say that. You're going to like a formal wear. This is not too shabby. This is called Ormond Man from 2004. And, um, does that, does that look like a Chanel outline to you? Look at that. Does that look like Chanel? Hmm. Interesting. Um, so Ormond Man is, um, look at that again. Hmm. Ormond Man is, um, by the house of Ormond Jane. And um, this is cardamom, pink pepper, bergamot, coriander, juniper berry with Canadian hemlock in the heart and Laotian oud is what they say. Although, don't worry, you won't hardly get any oud in this. Cedar, sandalwood, musk, and vetiver. So if you read the little blurb from the, from the brand, it's like the deadly note of Canadian hemlock or whatever the hell it is. Black hemlock or, you know deadly nightshade, you know, just ridiculous stuff. And then, of course, the most expensive and elusive oud note from the furthest corners of the world. But really, it just smells like a spicy, woody, generic, easy to wear, but well done, um, masculine, right? Lots of cedar and sandalwood and that oody note that you were getting in the early 2000s. Um, and it is pleasant, okay? That's the way I would describe it. I would describe it as pleasant and well made for formal outings, right? When you don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to wear, um, you don't want to wear Kinski by Kinski by uh, Giza Schoen. Oh man, but I, I love Giza Schoen's Kinski by Kinski. That's my favorite Giza Schoen of all time. Okay, next on the list is going to be number 11. And now we are going to an actual Pierre Bourdon fragrance that made the list. Since I don't own Francesco Smalto's Full Choke, we are now on to a fragrance by the house of Parfums Grey. And actually, actually, I must admit, 
This fragrance is surprisingly good. Surprisingly good for a designer. And I know Pierre Bourdon is the absolute man, but this is like a very interesting take on a fougere. And it has that pineapple note in it. So just like Full Choke, this also has the pineapple note. This is called Cabaret Om by the House of Parfums Grey. Okay. Um, and Cabaret Om, I like the presentation. I think it's a classy presentation. Really like the presentation. Um, this is a one-run fragrance. You don't have to worry about reformulation. Get it while you can. So Cabaret Om is sort of this interesting blend of um, tradition. Like this fragrance goes from 2004 back to the 80s. Yeah, instantly back to the 80s with the way that that fougere structure is created. With the lavender, even though there isn't any listed, it smells like you're getting geranium. It smells like you have a classic fougere structure. But on top of it, Pierre Bourdon sort of just imposed this modernity, this pineapple, fruity, fresh juniper berry, a little bit of rosemary to keep it masculine. And so you get throwbacks of the old barbershop fougeres of the past. It's green, it's spicy, but it's also strangely fruity and modern. It's like you're walking two paths, you know, it's like you're walking the path in 2004, but you're remembering that walking that path in the 80s, right? Same path, still there, but you're walking it today, but you're remembering walking it as a younger man. And it's so classy for a designer. This is, this is what designers, you know, this is what kills me about perfume today, is this is what you used to be able to get for 20 bucks. And now, you know, it, it, people try to sell these bottles for hundreds online. Don't pay hundreds for this. Um, not that it's not worth it because price is subjective. And if you're going to compare this to a modern designer for the same price, I would tell you to get this. But um, um, it's just, it again, it just seems like everything gets worse, you know? And um, I miss fragrances like this. I really do. I really, really miss this. And I miss Pierre Bourdon in, in perfumery. I miss what he brought to the table. This is amazing stuff. I mean, he's just uh, the master. And this is something that, even though it's a old school spicy fougere, I, I like to wear my fougeres in the heat. So for me, that's like a spring summer. I would wear that in spring and summer. Um, love it. Absolutely love it. And I think I got that from fragrancebuy.ca for like 35 bucks because it's a tester, I think. Is it a tester? 100 mils, and it doesn't say. Made in France. Anyways, I got it for a, a great deal. Um, excuse me whilst I hydrate. Okay. So, where are we? This room smells amazing. We're at number 11. So, now we're at number 10. And number 10 goes to Jean-Claude Elena and the house of Hermes, um, and probably one of the sweetest Jean-Claude Helena fragrances I've ever smelled. And actually, I enjoy it. It's a, it's a sweet gourmand, if you will. There's this weird uh, amber, tobacco, sesame seed, fruity, honey, spicy thing in here. And this is, uh, this is actually a vintage bottle. This is an old one uh, of Ombre Narguilé. So, Ombre Narguilé, I don't know if you can see that. Whoops, let's put it the right way, shall we? There it is. Ombre Narguilé um, is a Western expression of Eastern fragrances. It has a warm, sensual, enveloping, almost carnal smell. And I wanted to, this is from Jean-Claude Elena. I wanted to imbue this idea of amber with the memory of the East I love by recreating the ambiance of those lively places where tobacco, blended with the smell of fruit, honey, and spices, is smoked in narguilés or water pipes, and where swirls of smoke diffuse a sweet sense of intoxication. So, honey, spices, amber, tobacco, fruit, 
maybe roasted sesame seeds. And, and you know what it smells like? It smells like apple pie. It smells like a beautiful apple pie. And you know what? Like I was saying earlier with Bogart, sometimes you just want something like this comforting. This is like an um, enveloping scent. This is a, this is a comforting scent. And normally, again, I don't like sweet fragrances, but for this time of year, like if you're going to wear these type of fragrances, these type of sweet fragrances, this is the time to do it, December. You know, this this is this actually, this would be a beautiful Christmas Day scent. This would be an absolutely stunning Christmas Day scent because there's something so playful and gullible, like you can just see your family members hugging you, your, you know, your kids hugging you if you have children, or there's something, there's, there, there is an ambiance about it, but I don't get, I don't get water pipe tobacco, to be honest with you, I get, I get sweet, um, maybe closer to the Thierry Mugler we sent, we just smelled, but more grown up, obviously Hermes is not going to put out what Terry Mugler is putting out, but there is something, um, there is something about it. Maybe something slightly boozy as well. Maybe just a little bit of, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're drinking a little bit with that, with that water pipe. Um, Ombre Nargile though, I mean, for what it is, I, it does what it does very well. Let's just put it that way. Okay, so that was number 10. Number 9, we have a Creed. Um, I don't even have to spray this because I know this like the back of my hand. This is the second bottle of this. I went through an entire 75 mil bottle and I got another 75 mil before they changed to the 50 and the 100 mils. This is a 2016 batch. This is 16J01. This is Creed's Original Vetiver. So, Original Vetiver... Um, it's funny because Original Vetiver came out in 2004. Original Santal came out in... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where am I? Yes, here I am. Original Santal came out in 2005. And um, uh, neither fragrance smells original. Original Santal smells like uh, Mont Blanc's uh, Individual. And Creed's Original Vetiver smells like... Um, it smells like Jean-Paul Gaultier's um, Cologne or whatever they called it. Um, was it just cologne? Well, they put out a cologne. I forget what it was called, but a couple years before this, they put out a cologne. This smells very similar to that. But to be fair, to be fair, this is an elegant, um, fresh vetiver is how I would describe this. This is a very fresh citrusy vetiver. The, um, Creed does fresh fragrances very well. That's just what they do. Um, this is very green, very fresh, and um, if you read the Creed website, they almost wrote something that gave me an aneurysm because they were like, we don't just use the root of the vetiver, we also use the grass. And I was like, what? The grass? The root is where all the essential... Well, no one uses the fucking grass. Are you out of your mind? Uh, but they were like, yes, we use all three parts, including the grass part of the vetiver. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, but that's what they said. And, but it says vetiver leaf, which whatever the hell that is, what is a vetiver leaf? Um, vetiver roots have leaves, but, um, no, they, they claim that they use all of the, oh, I think it was called, um, sorry to jump around, but I think it was called Mugler Cologne. Um, and believe it or not, Mugler Cologne is discontinued. If you can, if people are selling bottles of Mugler Cologne for $300 on eBay, if you want to just fall out of your chair that is unbelievable. Um, but this uh, is a, one of my favorite fresh uh, vetiver scents for the summer because I went through an entire bottle, like I said. This is my second one. And the reason it's so easy to just spray on in the summer, just let, just let, just absolutely coat yourself in this stuff, is because the citruses in the top are so beautiful. And it dries down to that brilliant, creed, smooth sandalwood with a very fresh, grassy vetiver. And um, very likable pink pepper. Um, it's just, uh, they say there's ambergris in here. I don't know. I mean, there is a little bit of a sparkle in here, but who knows? Maybe it's just creed's 
Ambroxan style creation, but it's good. It's very good. Very good for the heat. So um, number nine, Creed Original Vetiver. Number eight, another one that I really don't have to smell because I just reviewed this within the last month or two. This is called uh, Perfumum Roma's Patchouli. So thank you to the person who very kindly sent me this. Uh, I think it was Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. If I'm mistaken, I apologize. But yes, this is just, I mean, one of the best perfume aromas. Definitely full bottle worthy. If it wasn't for the fact that I already have Javoy's um, patchouli. And I also have another heavy patchouli that I would wear uh, it, and be just as happy as that. And it's called, um, what is it called? It's called Les Nerides Patchouli Antique. This is a brilliant patchouli. I'll, I I will review this one of these days, but um, it's just, you know, that earthy, danky patchouli, right? That that um, slightly heady, slightly scratchy patchouli, patchouli with claws, right? Um, and you can go check out my review of patchouli as well. There's more to this, obviously. There's some frankincense in here. It's slightly smoky, and this is, you know, to be honest with you, this... I may be of the mind that this is actually slightly better than this and slightly better than the Javois patchouli. I may be of the mind, but is it worth me buying this because of that? No, I would just wear those, to be honest with you. I mean, they're they're so close. They scratch the same itch. That scratchy patchouli, um, all three of these would scratch the same itch. And then if I wanted to go even further, I could just wear Caritzia Moods Woma, which takes that scratchy, earthy, dank patchouli and adds like um, manly 80s notes to it. Oak moss and, you know, leather and all this other stuff. So, animalix. Um, so, yes, but, but, but patchouli by Perfuma Roma is one of the best patchoulis I've ever smelled, hands down. Uh, just amazing. That, that house in general has blown me away. Uh, and I'm going to review Arso very soon. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, okay, so next on the list is number seven, which is actually from the same house. And this was tough because one of these had to go first. And smelling the patchouli, I feel like I made a mistake. But I'm going to smell this now. Oh, and I feel like the universe is right again. Oh, it's so good, though. Uh, I mean, I, it, it, those could flip-flop any day. But uh, this is Perfuma Roma's Fior de Ambra. Or Flower Amber. And... Um, the flower in here is opium poppy, which is very interesting because it actually smells like opium, okay? So this is sort of a spicy oriental. It's amber spices in this gummy, resinous opium. This is such a great animalic amber. And um, I also reviewed uh, the other amber that everyone loves from this brand, Ambra Aurea. So I've reviewed four Perfumum Romas in the last couple months, because I also reviewed from Fumitis, I think it was. That was that boozy vetiver, dark, very Ancre Noir-like. I loved every single fragrance from this house I've smelled so far. Every single one. And it's funny, because people keep telling me, don't worry, you got all the good ones. Like, you're going to get to the ones that are sweet and disgusting, and you're not going to like them. But so far, every single fragrance from the house of Perfumum Roma is a hit that I've smelled. Um, so Fior de Ambra is... If you like Opium by YSL, if you like Estee Lauder's Youth Do, if you like Aramis JHL, if you like those type of fragrances, Cinnabar um, by Estee Lauder, check out Fior d'Ambra. Beautiful fragrance from 2004 at number seven. Number six. Okay, number six we're going to smell. Because number six is um, what I would consider to be one of the greatest realistic incense smells of all time, period. Like one of the all-time greats. Very hard to do it incense um, and make it last. And that's the problem with this fragrance. It doesn't last, but it's called Giorgio Armani's Bois d'Encens. And I believe this is like a 2013 bottle maybe or 14, I can't remember, but it's an older one. Um, and um, so, so the story goes that... Basically what happened is the perfumer of Bois d'Encens, which, oh God, oh, it's so like peppery, lemony incense is so, so Catholic church. Pepper, vetiver, incense, frankincense. Michelle Almarac is a perfumer who's all-star, Hall of Fame, right? Mount Rushmore of perfumers. And um, 
he created this very spicy, smoky, you know, incense, but very bland, very, very boring. Not boring, but very basic, let's say, okay? And um, the uh, story goes that he brought it to Mr. Armani and says, you know, here's sort of the basic, just like the, just the basic nuts and bolts, right? We have to add everything on top of it. And he goes, nope, this is what I want. I want this. This is the smell I want. And he kept coming back to him with revisions and trying to add stuff on top of it. You know, more labdanum, more ambers, more, more this, more that, you know, um, maybe some patchouli. And, and our, Giorgio Armani kept saying, nope, nope, I don't. I just want the smell of church incense. And um, so he said, fine, here it is. Uh, and they released it. And it's known as one of the most realistic smelling incense. Like if you grew up, if you grew up Catholic like I did... This will definitely take you back to the priest walking up and down the aisle, you know, with the, with the little incense burner. Uh, and then the other priest is walking behind him with the water, splashing him on people. And if the water touches the person next to you, they do, oh God, the water touched me, you know. If you grew up Catholic, this will remind you of those days. There is no doubt about that, 100%. Um... And actually, I'm just looking at it now. Parfumo says it was last marketed by L'Oreal. I wonder if Bois Sans is discontinued. Wow. Can I put this on eBay for three grand now? Um, but anyways, I mean, does it last an hour? Maybe, if you have good, good skin chemistry. Um, but it definitely lasts 45 minutes. And those 45 minutes are some of the most glorious incense 45 minutes you will smell. But you just have to reapply. I mean, that, that, um, sort of, um, it's just so perfectly realistic in what it does. You know what I mean? It's like the, it's like the most perfect photo snapshot. Like if you just take a snapshot of Catholic church incense and turn it into a perfume, that's exactly what they've done. And, um, you know, it, uh, it deserves to be here because I think it is one of the best incense fragrances of all time. Just in its simplicity and its design and just what they put out, right? Um, some may say it's boring and I can totally see that. But sometimes I want to smell like this. Sometimes I just crave an incense. And when I do, it's either this or it's something like um, Incense Avignon or there's actually some incense scents coming up very soon, which we will talk about. Um, but if this is actually discontinued, that is a shame because the perfume world just lost one of the most realistic smoky frankincenses in the game. Interesting. Um, okay, so Armani's Bois d'Encens coming in at number six. Number five. Number five is a... Uh, Bertrand Duchafor, and uh, this is the fragrance that um, sort of brought that, uh, I would say, ISO-E super vetiver thing into being, and then I think Jean-Claude Elena picked it up and ran with it uh, a year or two after with Terre Hermes, but um, this is called Timbuktu, and this is an older bottle of Timbuktu, however, I must tell you that I have a newer bottle which actually I'm going to spray the newer bottle so I can preserve the juice of the older bottle. And um, I must say that the um, newer bottle of Timbuktu in this presentation is actually perfectly fine. I've smelled them both and I'll do a comparison video for you if you guys would like me to. Um, but to me, Timbuktu was always kind of a not lighter, but it, it wore sort of a little bit more airy. It was never a beast, ever, ever, never a beast, even in its older format. And, um, yeah, so this is, the, the newer bottle to me is perfectly fine for, for, you know, if it wasn't, trust me, I would tell you. But this sort of, uh, the way that Bertrand du Chaffour, so his genius to me, the genius of Bertrand du Chaffour is how he could take something like this green mango note in the opening of this 
and just put it in a fragrance like this where there's no other green mango note that I can think of in a fragrance that just speaks to me like this. I didn't even know I wanted green mango in a fragrance, right? The difference between Timbuktu and Solo by Loewe is that the guava note in this just seems weird and out of place. But Bertrand du Chafour can take something like that green mango note and just make it seem like, duh, why hasn't anyone else does that, done this? You know, it's just perfect. It, it fits like a glove. And, and then now I'm getting these wisps of incense in the back, right? Maybe a little bit of Divana, definitely this burning papyrus smell. And this other flower, which is rarely used in perfumery, called Caro Karundi. And I think it's a I think it's a um, African flower. Um, so you have the green mango, which is strange, but refreshing. You have the Caro Karundi, which is like a, I don't know, it's like an African flower of some sort. That, but a weird, a weird flower to use in perfumery. And then you have this Vetiver Isoe Super, but resinous base. So there's myrrh and benzoin and patchouli. So it is spicy and woody. The Isoe Super adds a little bit of throw, but it's not a beast. I mean, it lasts six or seven hours tops. Um, but this is Bertrand du Chafour at his best, when he could take something like the Green Mango or the, um, think about Dia Man. Um, Dia Man had some very interesting notes that... Um, you don't always find in 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 um, masculine perfumery. Um, Amouage Dia Man had um, notes like, for example, peony, which is a flower you don't always find in masculine perfumery. Plum blossom. Um, and so he's able to just kind of use these notes that you wouldn't think would fit. In a, in, a, in a fragrance, and he's able to make them just seem like they're always supposed to be there. That Blackberry note in Jubilation 25 is a great example of, of his ability to do that. Um, and, you know, if you take, actually, if you take something like uh, Zonka, Zonka is a great example of that as well. Zonka, he uses that Masala Chai note um, and peony and light and uh, lychee uh, blossom, like it's nothing. You know these ingredients that you're just not used to, and that's exactly what he does with uh, Timbuktu, and it works brilliantly. Actually, you guys may crucify me, but give me Timbuktu over uh, Tear Tear Hermes. Give me Timbuktu over Tear for sure, because Timbuktu has that. You know, Bertrand du Chafour is known as the magician because he can work with that incense note, right? And Jean-Claude Elena loves painting with watercolors. That's the that's the line everyone uses, right? And tear does seem to kind of disappear and go away on me, and I want to smell it more. I smell Timbuktu for the whole length of um, the wear, even though it doesn't last a very long time. Like I said, six hours, right? Six, seven hours. Um... While I'm wearing it, I can smell it with no problem. So I, if you made me pick one, I think I would take Timbuktu over, over Tear. But I've learned to... Tear has grown on me. Let's put it that way. I used to not like Tear de Hermes, but it has grown on me. I don't think it's the best Jean-Claude Elena, though, or anything. But um, I do think Timbuktu is one of the best Bertrand du Chafours. Okay. Next on the list. This is one you guys will crucify me for, but I'm sorry. I have to put it here. It's one of my all-time favorites. I just I I have to I have to, okay? And part of me doesn't want to doesn't want to spray it because I don't have very much juice left and I'm in conserve mode. Um but I'm gonna I'm gonna spray it because I love this stuff. And it is an Escada. It's a Michelle Amarac creation and it is magnetism for men. Yes, Escada Magnetism for Men at number three. Sorry, apologies, scratch that. Uh, number four on the list. Um, and Magnetism for Men. Oh, hate, hate spraying this and it not going on skin. Oh, you know, it's got this purple. So, you know what it starts off like? It starts off like a purple 
soda-like smell. Um, like, look at the color of the bottle. Imagine this purple soda vibe with resins. So Tolu Balsam is um, one, of the, one of the prominent resins, as is vanilla and leather. So imagine like a designer vanilla leather, right? Um, and that vanilla starts mixing with that cola vibe. So you get like a grape vanilla cola with leather tolu balsam and this pepperiness, woody pepperiness, right? So it's like a spicy, sweet, woody cola. Uh, there's that purple feel. There's the resinous feel. There's the woody feel. There's the peppery feel. There's the leathery feel. And I am just, I mean, again, for the, for the cooler days, I love this stuff. I must admit, I absolutely love it. And my, my juice goes to about right there. That's all I have, so I'm just kind of conserving it. But definitely one of my favorite, uh, des definitely one of my favorite Escadas. Um, you know, a I would love a backup bottle of that, but I won't pay what they're going for nowadays. They're going for crazy money. Um, there's a little bit of saffron in here as well, which makes it, I, I think that's what gives it a little bit of that strange purpley chemical cola smell. Um, very oriental in style. Amazing. Amazing uh, designer. Shout out to Michelle Almarac, the great. Number three. Actually, number two and number three are both Dior's. That gives you any idea of where we're at. Um, number three is a creation by the great Anique Minardo. I feel like I have to say the great every time I say Anique Minardo. Um, and this is, I guess I should have this all written out beforehand, but this is Bois d'Argent. Now, this is Bois d'Argent Cologne, which is the original version. Um, and so, you can see exclusive to Coutier Boutiques. Um, and yeah, the, the original Cologne version, I think, had an issue with the key. You couldn't have the atomizer and the cap. It was, it was, weird. It was a weird thing. Um, or maybe this particular one didn't come with the cap. I forget. But I'm going to spray this, even though I don't want to. One spray. Um, Bois d'Argent is... Oh, yes. So... Especially this cologne version. Fuck, this is so, so good. I, the next moment we get to number two, I would, I would absolutely love a cologne version of the next one. Damn near impossible to find. So I'll settle for anything with the green juice. But for now, for Bois d'Argent, Bois d'Argent in 2004 set the stage for Dior Om a year later. Um, this is Yemenite frankincense, Somalian myrrh, Florentine Iris Absolute, Indonesian Patchouli, Honey Amber, White Musk Leather, and maybe some like Cedar Sandalwood combo. I don't know. But um, it's definitely powdery incense is kind of how it comes across as. It's like a powdery, posh, like if incense, you know when LeBron James like used to take that... Um, was it Michael Jordan or LeBron James? I don't really watch the NBA, but they used to take that powder, put it on his hands and like throw it up in the air or whatever. Imagine that powder, that baby powder going up in the air. That's what the, um, that's what the incense smells like, right? So the incense in Bois d'Ensance is like an actual church wispy incense. This one's like a powder being thrown up in the air, but when you smell it, it smells like, it smells like a um, woody sort of, incense right but powdery and this is what led to Dior Om. this is this is sort of the blueprint and um just a an all-time classic especially in this version this cologne version oh my god it is oh i love wearing this stuff and believe it or not i like wearing this when it's a little warm out when it's a little warm I know a lot of people love wearing this in the cold. I like wearing it when it's a little warm. Um, so yes, Bois d'Argent at number three. Number two, number two is a decamp, but I have a review of this on the channel. And on that review, I said, I would not buy a bottle of this because I have Amouage Sunshine Man. 
I have since changed my tune. I love Sunshine Man. Actually, I think I like Sunshine Man more than this still. But I would love a bottle of this stuff. And I'm not going to spray it because this is all the juice I have left. I had two of these. Rich Mitch sent me two. And I used one. Uh, and I'm down to one. Uh, half of one. And this is Eau Noir. The Green Juice by Dior. Eau Noir by, by um, Francis K. I mean, what can you say about it? It is like cooking spices, you know, there's something definitely kitchen-like about it. There's white thyme and clary sage in the top. I love the, love the opening, I love the whole breakdown, but the lavender, there's this like food licorice -y smell. There's like this coffee gourmand thing. Um, vanilla and green stems, they call it. I don't know, but um, it's definitely like a if this is a gourmand, this may be my favorite gourmand. I don't know if I would consider this a gourmand, but maybe there's gourmand touches. Um, but I love it. I love the spiciness of it. I just, I'm a huge fan of Eau Noir. I've, it, I've grown, based on what I've smelled from these samples, I've grown to love it. And um, would love a bottle. Would love a vintage cologne bottle of Eau Noir one day. Um... I'm not ready to break the bank, though, but I would love a bottle. But uh, like the guy says on Grumpy or Old Men, you can wish in one hand and crap in the other and see which one gets filled first, huh? So I probably will not be getting a bottle of Eau Noir. But um, number one, number one on the list is a Comme des Garçons, my favorite Comme des Garçons, my favorite Mark Buxton fragrance, and it is Comme des Garçons Two Man, the Pebble bottle that everyone loathes because it just sits there. But this fragrance is brilliant. Actually, this fragrance came out one year after Gucci Pour Homme 1. And many people compare it to Gucci Pour Homme 1. And you know, maybe it was inspired by Gucci Pour Homme 1. But I think this is a better fragrance than Gucci Pour Homme 1. Take that to the bank. Um, this is a woody, spicy, dark, smoky scent. Um, I think it's Mark Buxton's masterpiece. Uh, and it is... Um, frankincense, again, frankincense with, um, a note of kumquat. So again, where Loewe, solo Loewe goes weird with the guava, the kumquat in here actually really works with leather, saffron blossoms, nutmeg, um, frankincense, which I already said, oh, and I'm getting the frankincense now for sure, vetiver, Curly mint. So there's a kumquat mint. Okay, just imagine this kumquat and mint with the <laughs> With this dark Mahogany wood incense, right? It's like It's like sitting at a 500 year old mahogany wood desk that um, Shit who was around 500 years ago. I don't know All right Let's scratch the 500 years ago. It's like it's like 200 years ago when Napoleon was roaming. Was he roaming 200 years ago? Let's say he was. 250, whatever it was. Um, and just this beautiful hand-carved mahogany desk that was made for him, right? A man of his stature. The detail. Just imagine the detail in every little... The, each leg of it is like a statue in and of itself, right? The amount of work and time that went into it. And that mahogany wood, deep, dark, um, and almost like you can see the rings of the tree, because they're not going to Walmart and getting it back then, right? They cut the damn tree down. They made it handmade. Everything is just brilliantly made. And um, on top of it, you just get the most perfect incense accord with the smoky, leathery dry down with that very interesting mint kumquat opening. Uh, which just adds a little bright freshness there. Like, you walk in to see the, the man sitting behind the desk, and you're greeted with something slightly fresh. And then all of a sudden, his presence just overwhelms you, right? Um, because this is a this is made to be worn on a man with presence. That's the way I think about Comme des Garçons, two man. This is like a man that has the strength of two men. It is... It's so... It's so good. It's just, for me, it's so, so good. And um, I think it's still available. You can buy this still. I don't know what it's like in its modern version. I got this from um, 
from Anouge at Enchante. And I don't know how old this bottle is, so I can't really speak to, to year. Um, but I can tell you that I love this stuff. And it's my favorite from 2004. So that's it. We did it. An hour and five minutes. What is this? What did I say? Uh, 16 fragrances, two honorary mentions. We smelled a bunch of stuff today. This was a damn good video. Um, so thank you to those who stuck around the full hour. Thank you to everyone who watches, comments, likes, subscribes, all the shit you guys do. It's amazing. Thank you for the support. Um, if you can make December the 10th at noon, I would love as many people to be there as possible. Ask as many questions of the Sultan uh, as possible. The Sultan Pasha uh, and his, the maestro of Atars. Um, you know, love to, love to have you guys there. So I'm not just me, me and him talking to myself. But um, if it works out that way, I'll be happy just to have him on the channel. So, But I'd love for a lot of folks to be there as well. So anyways, thanks for watching, everybody. Let me know what your favorites are from 2004. Let me know what movies or um, you know songs I missed because I'm not very good at remembering those and what was going on in 2004 and what your favorite fragrances are. And, and obviously, like I said, which ones from 2004 we did not talk about here. So thanks for watching. Cheers, guys. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.